knowledge of spoken mother tongue everybody speaks a mother tongue or the eradication of smallpox or polio by universal vaccination or the electoral right of adults to vote in a democratic country like india it means reaching everybody involving everybody given this we can ask the question that in this sense is universalization of mathematics really possible in india since 2010 universalization is mandated by law dr sosama talked about universalization as a effort which is happening all over the world but in india it has a special meaning because here it is mandated by law the right to education act 2009 and is also a constitutional right under article 21a it is a legal right of all young indian citizens approximately 200 million in number this is what a government document described as rte it says education as a right is a major shift a rights framework is a major shift which implies that the compulsion in free and compulsory education of rte that compulsion is on the state to ensure learning of equitable quality for all children in the earlier framework the responsibility was often placed on the children themselves by labeling them as it is interested or slow learners or on parents who were assumed to be unaware uneducated but in the right to education act article 8 it says the appropriate government shall ensure good quality elementary education conforming to the standards and norms specified in the schedule the word good quality entered law after rte 2009 mere universal enrollment is no longer sufficient for legal compliance the government must now ensure good quality elementary education for all and under the same act article 7 the national curriculum framework 2005 as a curriculum framework for the whole country so rte 2009 and ncf 2005 together provide the legal foundation the mandate for good quality education for all this is because ncf 2005 actually defines what is good quality education let's see what that is national curriculum framework 2005 defines good quality education as that which delivers equality of outcomes equality of outcomes it says good quality education is that which equips the child to overcome the inequality into which she is born so good quality education is defined in terms of overcoming inequality and building equality these are the exact words the formal approach 
of equality of treatment in terms of equal access or equal representation for girls is inadequate. Equal access is inadequate. Today, there is a need to adopt a substantive approach towards equality of outcome where diversity, difference, and disadvantage are taken into account. Mark you, these are all legal requirements after RT. So mere access is no longer sufficient. After RTA 2009 and NCF 2005, giving mere access to good quality education to the citizens does not fulfill the responsibility of the state. Every child in class one to class eight has a legally enforceable right to achieve and obtain a good quality outcome in her own education. I think all of us will realize the import of this right. It was indeed a great achievement of Indian democracy after a long history of movements against inequality. And it was a major political milestone. In Maharashtra, we know that history, Savitri Bhai Phule, 1848, the entire history, Atma Jyoti Bapule, Dr. Baba Zab Ambedkar. As an outcome of that, we arrive at RTE 2009, where good quality education is now a legal right of young citizens. Now let's take the question, what is good quality math education? Because that's what we are concerned with here. Good quality education must be in every subject. What does it mean in math? What outcomes must be ensured? I've listed a few, and I think you'll agree that a child who has received a good quality math education, she will be comfortable with her age appropriate class concepts. She would be able to correctly perform math skills and operations. She would like mathematics. She's self confident about her math and her understanding of math and she's ready to learn more if she wants to. Going further, she should be able to correctly represent and transform simple real life problems into numbers and symbols. She should have two-way translation skill representing real life problems with things and in numbers and narrating a real life situation for a given mathematical expression. I'm not going to go into details because you're all math educators. I'm sure you know what we are talking about. She should have developed problem solving, rational thinking and decision making skills. And she should be able to make reasonably correct estimates and approximations. Should be able to choose judicious, judiciously based on the available data, crit critical thinking. At this point, I would like to pay homage to our guru at Navdanbiti, a math educator called Professor W. W. Sawyer. This is what Sawyer has to say about universalization. In 1962, in a lecture, he says, the ability to think mathematically will have to be taken for granted, much as the ability to read a newspaper is at present. Such a change will seem fantastic to many people. So would universal literacy have seemed absurd a few centuries ago. To enter a new stage of history is always difficult. In a way, what Sawyer is saying is that RTE 2009 is a new stage of history for our 
our country. But what is actually universal today? I think you will agree with me that most children in middle and high school dislike and fear mathematics, unfortunately. This fear and dislike starts developing quite early. In fact, by class three and four, starts getting entrenched. Math starts making children feel stupid and underconfident, most children. On this ground reality, this is what Sawyer has to say. He says, the population today divides sharply into those who hate and fear mathematics and a minority of mathematicians. Those who hate and fear, obviously, by implication, are in a majority. And the next sentence is very sharp. He says, the remarkable thing is that such an outcome is accepted as normal. We accept this as normal. It is as if physical education cripples 90% of the children taking it. These are rather strong words about mathematical education. I think you would agree a rather pervasive mindset. It is widely accepted in India also that mathematics is not for everyone. There are a few gifted individuals with mathematical minds and aptitude. But for the rest, we will have to find ways to teach math so that children will remember the necessary procedures, at least till the exams. Universalization is a nice idea, but it is not possible in practice. Let me call this the exclusive mindset. Mathematics is an exclusive activity. Unfortunately, this mindset pervades the math education landscape in practice in most schools colleges. Let's look at some consequences of the exclusive mindset. According to this pervasive mindset, for the majority of children who are not mathematically minded, the mode of instruction must be based on what else? Rote learning of procedures. So math education becomes a process of drilling. At another level, most research in math education remains at the micro level. There is a rather marked avoidance to engage with the macro problem and the macro challenge of universalization as mandated by the Right to Education Act. This is what Sawyer says about rote learning. In discovering something for ourselves, we have a sense of freedom and conquest. In memorizing something that another person tells us and that we do not understand, we are slaves. In a way, Teaching by rote learning is making slaves of the learners. And nobody likes to be a slave. That's why soon children start resisting, start avoiding. 
Boyer talks about imitation mathematics, which builds fear. He says nearly every subject has a shadow or imitation. It would, I suppose, be possible to teach a deaf and dumb child to play the piano. When it played a wrong note, it would see the frown of its teacher and try again. But it would be obviously have no idea of what it was doing or why anyone should devote hours to such an extraordinary exercise. It would have learned an imitation of music and it would fear the piano exactly as most students fear what is supposed to be mathematics. What Sawyer is saying is that a lot of math education in most schools beyond a point is just imitation mathematics. And then he has this to say about bad math pedagogy. The depressing thing about arithmetic badly taught is that it destroys a child's intellect to some extent his integrity. Before they are taught arithmetic, children will not give their assent to utter nonsense. Afterwards, they will. Instead of looking at things and thinking about them, they make wild guesses in the hope of pleasing the teacher or an examiner. Strong words, but realistic. So with this background, let's come to the second question, which I posed in the beginning. Is universalization Universalization possible and can we assess if it is achieved? Let's take that discussion first. It can be assessed quite simply. Random sample, three way assessment with a practical component, oral questions, and a written test can be designed. And such a test. Such tests were developed and conducted in Goa by Navnimbiti for classes one to four and in Tripura state for classes one to eight. The sample tests are available on the NLF website, which I'll give you at the end of this lecture. I think all of us would agree that it is not difficult to assess whether or not a child has understood mathematics. So we can assess whether or not we are approaching universalization. In Goa, there was a three-year program in three blocks of the state, Sattari, Kangon, and Sange. I'm going to talk about Kangon, where there were 73 schools, 121 teachers, 1,974 students in nine clusters in the primary classes one to four. Navnambiti conducted a three-year program in the state of Goa in these three blocks. And at the end of each year, we were doing end year assessments. And I'm going to give you the results for Cancun, which were the best. In Cancun Taluka, after one year of the program, the average achievement level for the four classes reached 75% out of 100. In the second year, it further improved by 7% to reach 82%. In class one, it was 80%. Class two, 85, 3, 80, 4, 81. Universalization norms are generally defined as 85 by 85. That is 85% of the children, if they have acquired 85% of the competencies 
age appropriate competencies then we have arrived at universalization so in kankon after 2 years for all the classes across 1974 students we came quite close to universalization norms i also want to tell you about kumte beat kumte beat is in satara district in maharashtra where due to the initiative of the beat officer shrimati pratibha bharade in all the 40 government primary schools all the children are comfortable with mathematics navnimiti has actively participated and conducted workshops in the capacity building of the teachers there with the pedagogical approach we will which we will discuss later of learning by doing and understanding so what this shows is that through a systematic program it is possible to achieve close to universalization in realistic circumstances and i think that is the best answer to the question is universalization possible we are certainly confident at at nabnaviti that it is possible it can be done in any state it can be done in any school provided we approach it in a systematic and proper manner now let's come to the second part of the talk which is universalizing math in the classroom how do we do it in a classroom well the bad news is that it cannot be done in one class what can be done in one class is a substantial improvement of understanding but universalization requires commitment at the level of the school from class 1 to class 10 this is because mathematics is a structured subject and the lower structures are the foundations for the higher classes so if we want to universalize math in a classroom we have to have a commitment from all classes children coming from lower classes should be prepared for the class in which they have entered to achieve universalization at the whole school level we need a mindset which is different from the exclusivist mindset let me call it the universalist mindset and all the stakeholders should acquire this mindset and who are these the school management the teachers and the students themselves there should be the e b c d conviction e b c d standing everybody can do math there is a lot of discussion in international math education circles about the growth mindset universalist mindset at the individual level we can also call it as the growth mindset but universalist mindset goes beyond the individual level to address the whole school to address all schools in a taluka to address the state to address the country to address all young citizens the universalist mindset requires the gandhian commitment to reach the last person the last class in the class how do we know if we have achieved universalizing universalization in the classroom i think you would accept these criteria every child comfortable with math every child enjoying math this needs a different approach different but not difficult but it does require 
a pedagogy for universalization, which is what we at Navin Mithi call the pedagogy of universal active mathematics. That's what I'm going to talk about now. These are the principles of universal active mathematics, UAN. The first is every child learning math by understanding and only by understanding. The second principle is the same as the first principle. Every child learning math by understanding and only by understanding. The third principle is the same thing, only by understanding. Mathematics has many languages, not just numbers and symbols. It has the language of things, actions, visuals, oral, and of course, the alphanumeric number, language of numbers and symbols. Let us note that the alphanumeric language in mathematics is an unfamiliar language for young children. So in learning a new concept, why teach it in an unfamiliar language? Children should learn language. Children should learn their concepts in a familiar language, in a universal language. And this is a language which is understood everywhere in India, everywhere in the world, in every country, every continent. Children build their understanding of concepts in a gradual ascent of problem solving by doing and constructing with actions and things, by experiment, doing and discovering. So the introduction to the concept is by doing and constructing. We'll see a couple of examples of that. Okay. The next step is to construct a process of translation into the language of numbers and symbols. And in this translation, pictures, diagrams are part of this process. So there are things, there are pictures, there are alphanumerics. Let me give a few examples of the learning by doing. This is a game that children love. I'm going to play it with you. I'm going to demonstrate. Unfortunately, in this mode, I can only demonstrate. But when we play it with children, it's not a demonstration. It is a problem that they have to solve. This is a game that we can play with them. How many cubes in this hand? Two. Two. Two How cubes. many cubes in this hand? Three. Yes, three. Four, four, three, I think. Four. Right. Now, how many cubes in my right hand? Right hand has got two. Two, two. Left hand? Three. Three. Okay. And now the problem is how many cubes in my fist? 
should be five. Obviously, yeah. I'm not asking you to play the game. I'm just describing a game that we play with young children. My grandchild loved playing this game, and she's not yet in class one. She loves playing this game. Okay? So obviously, when children can answer this question correctly, they have learned some mathematics. But we have not, not written anything. We have not written any numbers. But that child has understood a basic mathematical concept, the mathematical concept of addition. Question now is, how do you translate this understanding of the concept of addition into an alphanumeric representation? I won't discuss that here, but I will discuss this very shortly in a different context. The point I'm making here is that a concept learning can be done in things language. Second part is translating into alphanumerics when that child is comfortable with the concept in things language. But let me pose this same problem in a different way. I have five cubes in my hand. And there are two cubes in my right hand. So how many cubes in my fist? Three. Three. Yes, sir. That's a class one problem. I'm now going to pose this as a class five problem. Here is a problem. This is an unknown number. How will I write this? If I call this X, how will I write this problem? X plus two. X plus two is equal to five. Five. X plus two is equal to five. That's right. Now note, it's the same things problem, but in one representation, it is a class one problem. In the other representation, it is a class five problem. But the ground understanding is the same. Let's now take another problem like this, a slightly higher level. I have a slate here, and this is one cube, this is two cubes, and now I join it. So this is two plus one. This is three cubes, and we see that two plus one is equal to three. And this is also a class one problem. But let me take the same problem. Before going there, let me write it here. Two plus one is equal to three. And this is the alphanumeric problem in class one. Now let me take the same problem and change it a little bit. This is one, provided this is one. But, Now, if this is by one, if this is by whole, what is this? One by four. One by four. Half. And what is this? Half. One by two, half. One by 
2. And I'm, I put a plus sign, so what do I have to do? I have to join because addition is joining. And I get this, but if this is one, what is this? What is the pink? Three by four. Three by four. Three by four. So here we have a class four, a class five problem. One by four plus half is equal to three by four. This plus this is always equal to this. The ground level understanding with things is the same, whether it is a class one problem or a class four problem. And now let's jump to class six. And now, This is no longer one or three by four. Now this is A and this is B. This is A, this is B. So what is this now? A plus B. Plus B. A plus B, very good. This is A plus B. So, if this is A, now, what is this? I've taken A, A times. 3A. Well, now this is no longer 3. Now this is A. So I've taken A, A times. So I a guess square, something that looks, a square. looks like a square. So this is A squared. And similarly, this is this is B, so this is B squared. B squared. And this is A, this is B. I take A, B times. I take A, B times. So what I get is A, a times B. B. A times B, A, B. And this is another version of a times B. And now I can join them, which means I'm adding. So this is A squared plus AB. And this is A squared plus another AB. So it is A squared. A squared plus two AB. And, and what I get? is another square. So it is this times this. But what is this? A plus B. A plus B times A plus, a plus B. B. So this is A plus B, the whole square. Yes, sir. Which as we see is A squared plus 2AB plus, two plus, plus B squared. Square. Now, we have been joining these cubes in class one, in class four, in class six. And in fact, these same materials can be used going ahead to even class eight, nine, class 10, beyond that, class 11 and 12, and even higher mathematics. There are problems which can be posed with these same cubes, which are challenging 
to MSc and PhD math students. But they're the same cubes with which pre-primary children play. And the principles are the same. A very simple principle, addition is joining. So because addition is joining, we can construct mathematics by a physical construction. I hope I've made the point that children can begin to understand concepts just by giving you these two or three examples. I'll give you one more example of a game that my grandchild loves to play. It's a game of comparison. I have this card here, these cards. She knows now the numbers from one to nine and zero. I show her this number and she has to make a tower. So this is the answer to this problem. I give her another problem. And she constructs this. I give her another problem and she constructs this. This is one game. There is another game which she likes to play, which is a game using these symbols. This one, which all of us know, and this one. And the game is like this. I put two rods in front of her. And she has to place the card. And in this situation, she places it like this. I replace it like this. It doesn't change. I change the position of this and this, and she knows that she has to put the card like this. And then along the way, I put this, and she knows, and this is what she does. Now, when she is doing this and she's playing this correctly and she's enjoying it, she has understood some mathematics, hasn't she? She has understood that this means equality, except that she places it like this and not like this. But does it matter? She has understood the concept. When she uses this card, she knows that this is greater than and less than. It's not the same symbol as that alligator's mouth, but she knows the concept. She has understood the concept. It's a step from here to combine her earlier understanding of these cards with these cards and take her to understanding that When I put these two cards, I have to make this here and make this here 
And then when I do this, this is the sign or I can also have the same sign for this. And after playing this game a lot slowly without ever telling her what she should do, just playing the game, over time, the understanding is built in her mind in a very fundamental way that two plus two is equal to four. And I don't have to teach her this. It's too early. She's not yet in school, but she understands this because she has understood how to make two plus two. She has understood how to compare. I mentioned this example as another example of how children can understand concepts by doing and how children can learn mathematics by understanding and only by understanding. Alphanumerics is far away. Start with the familiar and then step by step, we translate into alphanumerics. In between, there are pictures. I won't discuss that more, but there is graph paper, which is very, very useful. And uh, one can do a lot of experiments, a lot of experimenting with these Dean's blocks, units, cubes. And when you make a rectangle with unit cubes, you can place that rectangle on graph paper and see that it exactly covers a certain number of squares. And then you can translate from this to a picture by drawing the outline of that rectangle which you had made with blocks. So now we have a translation to a visual representation and from this to an alphanumeric representation. I won't go through the details. I think it's quite clear what I mean by this. Let's continue now. These are all examples of two-step pedagogy, understanding with things, and then the next step of translating to alphanumerics. Now, In this approach, what are we aiming for? We are not aiming for producing Olympiad performance from a few scholars. However, this experiment approach is also relevant for Olympiad premiums. We are not aiming for speed. We aim for depth, which comes from understanding, everybody doing an understanding. And for this, there are useful tools there is what we call it Navdhanvithi, the experiment kit, which consists of these cubes, the units, tens, hundreds, kit, beans blocks. There is the powers of 10 currency kit for making two digit numbers and beyond. There is a very, very effective and very useful number line. There are about eight to 10 simple low cost items, which are extremely versatile. And the important point is that the same items are relevant in class one all the way up to class 10. We don't change those items. We just change the language, the alphanumeric language that we put on those items. The hardware is the same, the software keeps changing. 
And since children are familiar with the hardware and they know how to translate, they develop familiarity with the software of high school mathematics, geometry, and algebra. The second part of that of these tools is a set of workbooks, which I'm going to show you, called the Ganit Talim workbooks, which is what my student colleague mentioned earlier. These are workbooks from class one to class one, class two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And these workbooks and these worksheets are a carefully designed set of problems through which children learn to translate from their things understanding into alphanumeric understanding. They're obviously pictorial, but the sequence of concepts is so laid out that children ascend in understanding. And when they have solved the problem, their confidence increases. And of course, then the other set of tools is the year-end assessments and the mid-year assessments. All of these materials, the workbooks and the assessments are also available on the NLF website, freely downloadable for non-commercial purposes. The experiment kit is available from the Navdinviti EduQuality team here at Mumbai, and the workbooks are available from the Learning Foundation team at Pune. This combination of tools is a package which can be used to build a systematic program for universalization. These were the tools that we used in Goa, in Tripura, and other places. Now, if you're aiming for universalization, it's not a one-year effort. There has to be at least a three-year systematic effort. There has to be capacity building for all math teachers in the school, but it is not rocket science. It is straightforward implementation of certain principles. And what is basic is this, the method of problem solving. Math learning is an ascent. There are no shortcuts. The shortcut tricks can be discovered later. Understanding is constructed. And the ascent can be entirely achieved by gradual problem solving. But what is important is that children must solve the problems themselves. It's not that the teacher demonstrates to the student how to solve the problem. They can do so individually and also in groups. So the art and science of math teaching is for the teacher to pose problems in sequence for the students to solve themselves. Repeat, problem solving is not demonstration. And problems are posed in all the different languages of math, things, actions, diagrams, pictures, words, numerals, symbols. And I may say that this approach, learning by doing and understanding, is not only a methodology for the primary grades, it is a universal methodology for upper primary math and also for secondary math. And I would go so far as to say that it is a methodology for even graduate and postgraduate mathematics learning by doing and understanding. Geometry and algebra can best be learned by this approach. The experiment kit also has these broomsticks, which are the best way to learn geometry. Some of these things are demonstrated in the videos, which are available in the Navdimiti EduQuality website, the homepage on YouTube. There are some 35 videos 
how in an interaction with a student, concepts are built up. Those videos are slow because they're actually working with students. So they're not for casual watching, but the concepts of class six are developed systematically in those videos, the class six, seven, and eight. This is what Sawyer says about doing math. He says, we can go to a stage beyond talking about things by drawing pictures of things, by arranging for the actual handling of things. There is evidence that this greatly increases the proportion of the population capable of learning mathematics. And this evidence is on a mass scale. Mass scale is important. Without mass scale, no universalization. About geometry, this is what he says. The best way to learn geometry is to follow the road which the human race originally followed. Do things, make things, notice things, arrange things, and only then reason about things. And then he says, who is a mathematician? The essential quality for a mathematician is the habit of thinking things out for oneself. And that habit is usually acquired in childhood. It is hard to acquire it later. What he's also saying is that children who are taught mathematics in this way at an early age, they're all mathematicians. Maybe they won't become Ramanujan, but they're thinking things for themselves. That is what mathematics is all about. The most important thing in the early teaching of mathematics is that the student should form the habit of weighing evidence of deciding for himself or herself. And finally, he says, what is success in mathematics? This is a definition that applies to the entire spectrum from the novice to the professional. It applies to the students in school. It applies to geniuses like Ramanujan. This is Sawyer's definition of success in mathematics. Complete success would mean that every individual felt I enjoyed the mathematics that I had time to learn. If I ever need or want to learn some more, I shall not be afraid to do so. I shall not be afraid to do so. Self-confidence is perhaps one of the most important aspects of being comfortable with mathematics. And that's why problem solving, learning by problem solving is important. Because when children have solved the problem themselves, they develop self-confidence. Now I come to the last point of this presentation about why universalization is particularly urgent today. It's particularly urgent because of the pandemic. I think you would all agree with me that it is not an exaggeration to assert that this pandemic has resulted in not just a crisis, but an educational disaster. Most children have lost out on nearly two years of math understanding. This can become a permanent handicap. The universal rescue effort is urgently needed. I think all of us who work with children understand that online education has not worked. And children who are spending time Sir, you're not audible. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
children who are spending time in online education, they are not coming out with understanding. Unfortunately, the government is not recognizing this situation as a crisis, much less a national disaster. It is viewing this crisis as a business opportunity for edutech, as a boost for corporate online digital and data industry. And this is in keeping with the perspective of the new education policy 2020. And in fact, is one of the major flaws of NEP 2020. The needs and requirements of the corporate digital companies cannot take precedence over the educational needs and rights of Indian children. Online education is not a solution to the crisis. On the contrary, in its present form, it is contributing to the crisis of educational deprivation. So the crisis cannot be addressed by providing children with more laptops, tablets, and data access. Children who have all these are still facing educational deprivation at this orientation due to the intrinsic limitations of online learning. The uncritical enthusiasm of the government for online education cannot be allowed to stunt and damage the learning of the next generation. Virtual learning cannot substitute actual learning. Online mode and virtual learning is useful only as a subsidiary and supplement to actual learning. It can never be a substitute for actual learning. We owe it to our children to communicate this message strongly to the state and central governments by the ed educational community, <laughs> parents, school managements, and educational policy experts. And when we do this, we should also prepare ourselves to face the consequences. It is imperative to engage students systematically in actual learning, even during the pandemic. This is the responsibility of the state, but we have to experiment with ways and means and show in practice how this can be done. The EBCD Math Collective was one such attempt by the Navdimiti group, along with a sister organization called EduGeni. Navdimiti Learning Foundation, Navdimiti EduQuality Foundation, the Navdimiti Trust, and EduGeni worked together to provide video assisted actual learning through experiment problem solving. These videos are available on the YouTube EduQuality homepage. But that is not, the emphasis on online is not the major flaw of NEP, it is a big flaw. The fundamental flaw of the new education policy is that it seeks to backslide right, and right. renege from universalization. It recommends going back to mere access rather than responsibility for outcomes. It seeks to amend RTE 2009 and NCF 2005. It is designed to replace quality education for all by quality education mm -hmm. as a market commodity. In a market for commodities, those who cannot afford will always get seconds. That is second class quality. In education, this would be illegal under existing law. So NEP 2020 is in violation of the Right to Education Act 2009. And for this very basic reason, it cannot be accepted. 
as citizens of India, we have to act to defend and protect the democratic gains of the last century. And for ensuring good quality education to all, government and aided schools, which cater to the common citizens, have to be nurtured and strengthened. So we have to go forward with a universal mindset. You have to understand that NEP 2020 is just a policy. It is not law. Right to education 2009 is law. We should therefore not hesitate to challenge NEP 2020 on those basic deficiencies like undue emphasis on online education and going back on universalization. We are on strong ground. So in this Amrut Mahotsav year of 75 years of our independence, as citizens with the fundamental duty to protect and promote the values of the Indian constitution under Article 51A of that constitution, the values are of equality, secularism, religious pluralism, socialist democracy. Question is, can we collectively take up this responsibility and task? There is both the necessity and the possibility for building math universalization in India and elsewhere. In India, we have the legal foundation. Elsewhere, perhaps not. As they say in mathematics, the necessary and sufficient conditions exist for math universalization, provided we work collectively, sharing our resources, our experiences, and our learnings. Math universalization in one school, in a whole school, sets an example for the whole of society. If we can show that it is happening in a few schools or in one school, the question can be raised, why is it not happening elsewhere? The main argument against universalization is the myth that it is not possible. By showing that it is possible, we create the grounds for actually taking it forward, which we have to do as citizens. So my last question is, can we think of establishing a network of organizations, schools, teachers, and individuals who are firmly committed to this objective of math universalization. I will conclude with this question. I thank all of you. And these are the websites where all the materials that I've talked about and shown in this presentation are available. These are some useful web resources. You click on navnimrithilearning.org, click on Universal Active Math Resources. There you have teacher manuals, worksheets, assessments in different languages. There is a YouTube series of 35 videos on the Navnirmiti Air Equality Foundation homepage in YouTube titled Janaganit. And just as icing on the cake, there is a video about how Ramanujan himself was an experimenter. It's titled Ramanujan's Teacher, GS Carr and Experimath. Thank you once again. I will conclude here and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. So we have one question. The question asks, how to attract students of ninth and 10th 
towards mathematics so that they can move forward with this amazing subject? Shall I answer that question first? Yes, sir. Let me answer it honestly. By class nine and, nine and 10, children have largely already developed an aversion to mathematics. Most children, except for a few. And the reason for that is that their fundas of the earlier classes are not clear. So I would suggest that in class nine itself, those children are given some problem solving sequences in the concepts from class six, seven, and eight. Some of those sequences are there in these 35 videos. They're also there a large number of problems are systematically there in Ganit Talim for class five, Ganit Talim for class six, Ganit Talim for class seven, and Ganit Talim for class eight. These books are available now in Marathi and very soon they will be available in English. Children will learn their concepts clearly when they work through these books. And it's always useful to start at a level where children are comfortable and then work upwards. If they are in class nine, it will not take them more than one or two months, two months at the maximum, to work through a complete book with us. When they've cleared their concepts, they will start developing a greater mathematics. Without clear concepts, it's difficult to develop an interest in mathematics. I hope I've answered your question. Any other questions? So I think there are no questions now, sir. So thank you very much, sir, for such an enlightening session. And I like that uh, quote that came up. I enjoyed mathematics that I had time to learn. If I ever need or want to learn some more, I shall not be afraid to do so. So it's Absolutely. a nice quote. Uh, thank you, sir, for taking us through the policies and the acts. And uh, I now, uh, we will have a short presentation of a uh, small research that we have done. And uh, after that, we will conclude the session. So please stay back, sir, for this presentation. I will, I will. I, thank uh, you very much for this opportunity to interact with all of you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I invite Susan to make the presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Susan, have you started because we can't hear you? Ma'am, was I not audible? No, no. Ma'am, I'll start again.
I would like to thank the organizers for arranging such wonderful sessions. Uh, I am from uh, Kashmir. I am a teacher, and I would like to thank you all. Thank you very much. Okay, sir. Uh, Susan, uh, we cannot hear you. So, is there any uh, problem with your mic? Ma'am, no. I'm. Uh, can you hear me right now? Now we can hear you. But when the presentation, Susan, when you start your presentation, you are on mute. I am sharing my audio as well. Uh, I'll share the entire screen. Is my screen visible now? Yes, yes. Now yes. You, you, we can hear you also. Okay. So I will be presenting last time's webinar uh, survey that we did. And the topic was mathematical creativity, perception, and development. So in traditional math classes, teachers display problems on the board or screen and solve them while giving detailed explanations and then ask students to solve the parallel sums. Recently, however, teachers are increasingly aware of the importance of addressing a variety of learning styles. However, the presentation is the same. Teachers model the process and students work independently to copy it. To study the views of our participants regarding the creativity in maths, we conducted a survey titled Mathematical Creativity Perception and Development. Let's glance at some of the responses. 88.5% of our participants voted that the statement students do not enjoy mathematics is false. Around 56.7% generally agree that students must adhere to procedures and rules in mathematics for success, while around 24 chose to remain neutral on this matter. When asked if students are given fixed time to complete their classwork problems while in class, a majority of 70% 70 agree generally with this statement, while 13.3% disagree. A total of 78% generally disagree that open-ended questions cannot be given to students in mathematics, while 12.4% are neutral and around 9.7% are in agreement with it. When asked if students are taught risk while talking while doing math problems, 54.9% agree, while 24.8% disagree. An overwhelming majority of 88.5% disagree that mathematics cannot develop creativity in students, while 8% disagree and 3.5% choose to remain neutral. Again, a majority of 97.4% agree that students must be given time to appreciate the beauty of mathematics, with only 1.8% in disagreement. 88.5% agree that problem-based learning can help in inculcating creativity in students. When asked whether the future of mathematics education is explained to students, 85% agree while 5.3% disagree. When asked if they help their students develop their intrinsic motivation for maths, 44.2% strongly agree, 49.6% agree, and 6.2% remain neutral. I do not make any attempt to develop creativity in students while teaching maths. This question gained 43.4% of strong disagreement, followed by 48.7% of disagreement, 4.4% in neutrality, while a general of 3.6% in agreement. I do not make any attempt, sorry, I do not bring in real life situations while teaching mathematics gained a total of 89.4% of disagreements, 5.3% of neutral, and 5.3% in agreement from our participants. When asked to choose multiple options when uh, about which domain mathematics teaching caters to, cognitive domain has the most votes with 77.9%, 
followed by 50.4% voting for psychomotor domain, while affective domain scores the lowest with 46.9%. Mathematical creativity is rooted in the intellectual abilities and personality traits of each individual, and direct influence of education is only moderate. Education can have more influ influence on three important components of creativity, and expertise, original thinking, and intrinsic mo motivation. However, creativity in classroom does not come easily to e every teacher or every student. The traditional resources are certainly ready to copy and easy to grade. A teacher's expertise and creativity with teachers' expertise and creativity, students can develop original thinking by ill-posed questions, open-ended problems, going wrong and making mistakes, and finding different solutions to the same problems, thus developing an intrinsic motivation for creativity in mathematics. Teachers who embrace a creative approach to mathematics education will need materials and supplies. Teacher, teachers will also need professional development presentations and mentoring. However, providing a present and receptive environment wherein students can find the beauty in math on their own terms will be worth the time, effort, and money. So let's try to make math creativity every classroom's reality. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for that presentation. And I would request uh, Father Blaze if he uh, would like to say a few words on today's webinar. Father Blaze. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Father. Your video is off. Yeah, but it, uh, yeah. it doesn't seem to come on. So I don't know. Huh? I'm not able to put on my video. But I'll, I will say something on audio that you can hear, no? Hello? Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Father. Yes, Father. You can yeah. hear me. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, but I'm not able to put on my video just now. There's some problem with the internet, I think. Anyway, uh, basically, I was very happy to, uh, to listen to Dr. Vivek Montero. I've known him. I mean, not, uh, it's quite a long time back while well, I was a student in college and uh, I knew that he was there. But it in a way vibrates with my own thinking and not only about mathematics but about uh, all education and the universality of education. And this has been my experience after spending 34 years out in the rural areas, particularly among Adivasi that it's not that they cannot understand uh, mathematics, but the method that is being used is not some with reality around them. Their understanding of mathematics is very much down to earth, connected with, uh, uh, with the things that they are dealing with, with agriculture, with the forests. And I think it is these that are uh, that vibrate with their understanding of uh, mathematics. And I think this would be common to everybody. Uh, we have tried to use different methods, methods like this, like in the villages, we have tried to use whatever they produce as things to practice or to, to play mathematics with them, with onions and potatoes and uh, bhindi and whatnot, all the vegetables that they produce. So it is something that they enjoy. It is something that they vibrate with. And I think what Dr. Montero, Montero has been trying to tell us, I think is something worthwhile and which we need perhaps to use much more in our uh, trying to make mathematics something easy from children and I have, I have seen that if allowed to think on their own with the reality around them, they are able to come out with mathemat mathematical solutions to many things besides other aspects of reality around them. And I think that is something worthwhile. 
and then something that he said at the end uh, about the government policies. I think we need to take that seriously. There are ideological problems involved when, when changing from one pattern to another. And these are determined by those who are uh, in authority, those who are ruling, those who are governing. Is this the type of education we want to give our children? Or are there not questions that we need to ask about NEP 2020? Uh, or is are we just going to accept everything and be pushed into that pipeline? So these are serious questions also, I think, which we need to ask. And then most of us here are teachers. And I think this is something, uh, this is a serious question that we need to deal with uh, as we go along. Because it is important for us to know, to see, that there is a plethora of cultures, of regions, of languages, of peoples that we have. And then the education has to respond and be relevant to their lives. And this is what we need to consider when we are thinking of policies with regard to education. Not just mathematics, but the entire area of mathematics. So. Uh, I think it was very enlightening to listen to Dr. Montero. And I think, uh, I, I mean, I vibrated very much with whatever he was saying with regard to the teaching of mathematics or other subjects also. This has been my own experience in the rural areas. And I think that is why we try to develop a different methodology uh, with different syllabus. Non-formal education in a way was our effort to bring education down to the level of people in the villages, or let me say, to draw out the potential that is there in them with regard to the education that we want to give them. We think they are ignorant and illiterate. They may be illiterate, okay. They may not have learned to read and write, but they are not ignorant. They are not ignorant of reality. They are not ignorant of mathematical process processes. They are using it in their daily life, in their field work, agricultural work, whatever, in building their own houses, in constructing their own houses. They are using mathematics, perhaps not in the way that we consider it, you know, cut and dry, but we know that they are doing it. They know how to understand the area and volume and things like this. And they know how to calculate. They are not ignorant of all these things. So I would like to say that we need to build on what is there. We need to bring together perhaps uh, things which perhaps might be new to them. But with, if we use the language and the imagery that they have, the real reality which is around them, I think they will understand mathematics more easily or any other subject more easily. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Montero. Uh, I've seen you, you for a long, long time. I'm seeing you after a long, long time. So it was nice to listen to you and uh, to show us how we can bring mathematics and make it universal for everybody. Yeah, Thank I look forward to uh, interacting more with you and also with your students. Okay, good. Particularly, particularly in doing some work on uh, trying to achieve universalization in schools and sharing our experiences. This joint learning activity is very important. Sure, sir. Um, I think now uh, it, we have a batch of uh, second year students as well as uh, the first year students are also joining us. Uh, so uh, we will definitely see that, you know, how you can interact with our students. And I'm sure that the BH students will learn a lot through this experience. So um, we've come to the end of this series of the webinar and I thank all the participants for attending. And I'm sure, you know, after listening to Sir, even I feel that SXI has contributed a little bit in the universalization of maths education.
So uh, if the teachers uh, think of these methods to be utilized and uh, if they take it forward, then I think even we are assisting in universalization of math education. So uh, to conclude this, I would invite uh, Saran to propose the vote of thanks. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. So a very good evening to one and all present here. It gives me an immense pleasure to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of SXI to all the dignitaries present here. The webinar made us all reflect upon many things, which gave us an idea about how to master our mind to excel mathematics by using different strategies and solutions, which will for sure empower our rational thinking. A special thanks to a resource person, an amazing personality, Dr. Vivek Monterio, for sharing his precious tactics on how we can boost our competencies through universalization. Your universal lookout on mathematics will boost mathematics learning in all numerous ways, sir. To all, to not only the teachers, but also the trainee teachers, professors, and all the learners present here. Your study on mathematics in different states, like you said on Maharashtra and Goa, was commendable, sir. Also, you have inspired us and also for making us understand and reflect upon how we can blend the NCF 2005 and Right to Education Act in 2009 to improve the quality education in mathematics. So very innovative touch of universalizing mathematics right from the primary to secondary to blending them together was exceptional, sir. Using alphanumeric would help students for all types. And also as a facilitator, we would use your approach called as experiment to innovate and creative manner. Also, we will try to inculcate what we learned today in all the possible way. Also, I would like to thank for your precious time and sharing your abundant knowledge with us, sir. A special thanks for Mr. to Mr. Akash Gadde for providing technical help to sir. Also, this session wouldn't be possible without Dr. Narendra Deshmukh from Homi Babal Center for Science Education, who helped us to get resource person of our day, Dr. Vivek Montejo. Also, I would like to thank our principal, Dr. Sosama Samuel, for giving us warm welcome with our views on mathematics, and also our manager, Father Blaise Tisoza, for encouraging us with his tactics on mathematics. This webinar wouldn't be successful without a staff coordinator, Dr. Vinay Sebastian. So I would thank her for giving me this opportunity and for all the countless help and coordination. Also, credit to our formation team, which consists of Blade, Numel, Olisa, Susan, Saloni, Rachel, and Ilsima who supported us all from behind the curtains. Okay, at last, I would like to thank our fellow participants for sharing all your experience on the table and engaging throughout the session. Looking forward to seeing you all again next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saran, for that vote of thanks. And thank you, all the participants. I request uh, Rachel and Saloni uh, to give some instructions about the feedback form. Yes, ma'am. So a gentle reminder to all the participants present here, link for the feedback form will be sent in the chat box of the Zoom meeting and in the YouTube chat now. Kindly fill it to get the e-certificates. Uh, please note that we are keeping the form open till 7.30 p.m. today. So all the participants are requested to fill the feedback form before 7.30 p.m. Also while filling the form, Make sure that you enter your correct email address or the certificate will not be delivered to you and also enter your name correctly because no changes would be done later. If you don't receive your certificate, please wait for 30 minutes and do check your spam folder. After 30 minutes, if you're still unable to get the certificates, then you can contact any of the student coordinators regarding the issue. Thank you. So let us uh, wind up for the day. I have put up the feedback link in the YouTube uh, channel also. Uh, can uh, anyone check there whether it is active? Yes, students, can you all check whether it's active there? Yes, ma'am, just a second. Yes, ma'am, it is active. Okay, so no problem. 
Okay, so thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, session and we will be closing now for the day. Can I close the meeting, students? You can see Father Blaze in the waiting room. Can I close the meeting now? Everything is okay, no? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I'm ending the meeting. Okay, bye. Yes, ma'am. We have submitted it. Where will we get the certificate now? Rachel, can you answer? I'm giving, uh, so you will get it within five to ten minutes. Uh, it, it will be available in our email or where? Yes, yes. It will be sent to your email address. The one which you have uh, entered in that form. Okay, okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.